So I guess right, that's, that's true. That's true. So it's just hit 10 o'clock um, and I see folks are um, joining us right now, which is great. Um, before Ali gets started, I want to do something that I'm going to forget to do otherwise, which is yesterday I forgot to launch our end poll. So if you will um, bear with me, the first thing I'm going to do is launch the poll that asks you how prepared you felt to teach um, fire physics at the end of yesterday. <laughs> So I know that's going to be a bit confusing. I'm but too old. That was yesterday. I have no memory <laughs> of yesterday. Try and cast your mind back to that. Thank you. <laughs> Fire All right. Great. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thanks, guys. I can do that. And then following this poll, <laughs> to really confuse you. I'm going to launch another one in a minute, which is going to ask you how confident you feel um, delivering the fire preparedness message. So that'll be about today. So, but we'll finish this poll first. And again, apologies for confusing folks. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I have not managed to explore all the features in Zoom. Is that just a feature in Zoom or is it an additional? Oh, okay, cool. I've just never used it before. Yeah, no, it's really helpful. The only thing that's worth um, knowing is that you need to set up your polls before you launch your meeting. So it's not something I could change at all once we're in the meeting. Got it. Um, okay, so I'm going to end the polling for that Thank poll. Um, and I'll share the results. We look a lot more confident um, from where we started from yesterday, which is great. Um, and now I'm going to, let's see. As you can tell, I'm still figuring some of these things out myself. So now I'm going to launch um, the how you're feeling about teaching um, preparedness. So if you guys wouldn't mind letting me know how you're feeling at the beginning of the session today about teaching fire preparedness. Okay, maybe just give a few more seconds in case you haven't had time. As I say, these polls really do help us. They're really critical for our grant, so we appreciate you responding to them. Okay, I'm going to wind that one up. Um, so I'll share the results there. It looks like we're feeling um, somewhat confident in these areas. Um, and hopefully by the end of the session, we'll feel even more so. So um, thanks for bearing with me and doing that with me. And I'm gonna turn over to Ali now. Hi, um, I just, before we get started with our guest speaker, um, I just wanted to give you all a chance to just kind of say who you are so that she can know who you are. And then also um, in the vein of wildfire preparedness, um, I'd love if you all shared one thing that you are planning to do, have already done to help prepare for fire season. Um, we had a funny thing happen this morning right now. They're testing the PSPS preparations for my area. And in doing so, somehow set a, a power pole on fire. Um, so I had a little bit of an early preview of PSPS because I lost power for an hour this morning, uh, which is very concerning as I was running around town trying to figure out where I could get power um, to host this. But luckily it came back on at my house just in time. Um, so I have definitely already prepared my go bag. Uh, for, both for my cat, which her go bag stays together all year round. And then um, I'm working on preparing my own personal go bag. So those are my fire preparations. Um, yeah, so feel free to just jump in um, and we'll just popcorn around. Okay, I'll start uh, getting ahead of gate for once. 
I'm Henry Bornstein. I live in Lake County. Uh, I'm a, a park docent and a member of the board of a volunteer nonprofit that works with Anderson Marsh State Historic Park to do uh, guided uh, nature walks and park tours and school field trips and where we do school programs mainly for elementary school, but also actually third all the way up to high school. Um, as far as what, getting together, I have, I have my go bag uh, issues because I use everything every day. So now I've got to the point where I'm storing things in the go bag all the time and pulling it out and using it, putting it back in the go bag. Uh, and then I realized that they, after a while that gets, that gets a little loose and I've got things spread around for every week or so. I reassemble my go bag and I start using it again because I don't have two of everything. So it's a, but I have, and it's on my mind. So I'm pretty confident that I could, uh, I needed to uh, get it together pretty quick. But we we evacuated. Lots of times in that 2017 in Lake County, we're getting pretty good at it. Similar to um, Henry, I'm Meredith Delusha. I teach uh, sixth grade um, multi subject at Ukiah Unified. Um, I teach at Palmolita. And similar to Henry, um, I have a go bag. I, um, I was actually staying in our newish house um, by myself last year and I already had a whole go bag set up and I, um, I was like getting really prepared, like right at the end of spring and my husband was kind of laughing. I had been evacuated last year while he wasn't living here. Um, and I was like, look, you can laugh, um, but all of the stuff is ready. And I made a separate thing of food for him so that he felt finally compelled to like, make his go bag. And um, all of the stuff is in a place where it's like right by the door, right by where the keys are, like everything to My name is Gay Henry, and I am um, a retired school teacher, and I'm a, a docent at Anderson Marsh State Historic Park in Lake County, and I work with Henry, and we do field trips and nature walks, and I'm just remembering after the Jerusalem fire we had in Lake County in 2004, 2000, uh, 2014, 2015, that I had a bag of important uh, photos packed and I had it left by the fireplace ready to grab. And Henry said, when are you gonna unpack that? And that was like two hours before the Valley Fire started, you know? Mm -hmm. so, um, so that stuff has been packed ever since. Uh, I not only have a go bag, but I have, for me, important family pictures. Papers I figure I can replace. And actually we also have a, um, What's the word I'm looking for? A generator ready to go when the power goes out so that if it goes out for any length of time, we can ke at least keep our uh, air, air cooler going and our refrigerator going for a couple days. I'm Haley. I'm in the Bay Area um, and so, and I'm not from California. So thus far in my living here, anyone has only ever told me to have an earthquake preparedness kit. Um, so this fire preparedness is very new to me. That was all new information um, as of yesterday and today. So my mind will be starting from zero. Uh, my name is Stephen Baptista. I'm a science teacher at a small rural high school uh, just outside of Yosemite. And uh, I have my go bag as well as a small portable safe that has all my important documents, passport, checkbooks, all that kind of stuff. And uh, we were largely affected by the rim fire and the school was the host for Cal Fire and the Forest Service while they were battling that. So mm -hmm. we're pretty well versed with wildfires up here. I'm Stephanie Barrett and I am with the 4-H program and um, I don't really, I mean, I have a small safe where I keep all my personal like important papers. I don't really have a go bag in a sense of, I keep some stuff in my car, like emergency stuff in my car, so it's always there. Um, but as for fire, a lot of houses would have to burn in order to get to mine. So um, it would be, um, 
for me, fire would affect me if it was just a personal house fire. So I haven't really, really thought about doing a fire tote bag. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Mark Garrett. Um, I have a go bag. Actually, my car is is um, is fully sustainable for car camping because I go to the ECR quite a bit. So there's food, water, clothing, and it's ready for sleeping inside. So that's ready. And I'm also currently red carded firefighter part time through Yosemite, so I could be called out on a wildfire incident any minute to go as a resource advisor or fire archaeologist. So I also have a red bag with all my firefighting gear in the car ready to go as well. And we've been evacuated here in Mariposa town back in the Detweiler fire a few years ago. And we've been threatened by other fires like the Ferguson and, and Bryce fire that have come close to threatening town. So this is definitely a hot spot for, you know, potentially a devastating wildfire to wipe out the entire town. So I think we're we're pretty much on high alert and ready to go here. Great. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, I'm just gonna introduce um, Ms. Mackenzie Skye is a private consultant and licensed mental health practitioner and has over 20 years of experience helping those who have been traumatized by sudden and unexpected disaster. She has worked with schools, government agencies, Fortune 500 companies, and the American Red Cross, both in natural disasters and accidents, such as wildfires, gas line explosions, airline disasters, floods, earthquakes, and in man-made disasters, conducting critical incident debriefings and diffusings, providing treatment and diagnostics to military personnel returning from war zones and working on site in the field with school shootings, bombings, homicides, and suicides, working with um, federal and law enforcement agencies. Um, we're so thankful uh, that you were able to come chat with us a bit today um, to learn a little bit more about um, how to work with students, teaching them about um, wildfire when many of them have experienced trauma from wildfire. Um, so I'm sure that you all have a few questions for her, but I'll just start off. Um, so Mackenzie, I'm curious if you have some advice for us about how when working with students who have been traumatized by wildfire, um, how can you try to set up lessons and um, discussions to avoid triggering students trauma um, and how what are some of the signs we can look at to know how when we need like when we need to call in outside help when we need to have the counselor come in and talk to the students yeah i think can you hear me everyone can hear me yep. um i think um we all know what anxiety brings on or stress brings on. And for all of us, it's all different, right? Kids are no different, whether it's a headache or a stomach ache or um, difficulty getting along with other kids, arguing you know, with the teachers or arguing with you, uh, not getting schoolwork done, uh, difficulty sleeping at home, difficulty eating, isolating themselves, they don't wanna socially connect. Uh, there's all kinds of all kinds of symptoms that you can observe and see and in presenting materials if you find that you're involved with a group that um, you can see that they're having difficulty they don't want to talk about an issue or they don't want to talk about something you know that they're still dealing with a lot of unresolved anxiety and unresolved fear so I had sent something to Hannah that I think might be helpful for you guys. Hannah, did you maybe see that this morning? Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. That's not your fault, sorry, I'll learn one day. No, no, that's okay. So was it the thought, um, let me see, I have it, it in the thought record. So I'll, I'll share the screen right now so folks can see that. Just give me a second, I'll make sure it's- And this was just an idea for you. Mm -hmm. Bear with me just one second. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that now. Okay. 
So uh, can everyone hear me still? Yeah. Yeah, so I think this might be a really good thing to give students. And of course, the curriculum is the curriculum. And you can insert this where uh, uh, Hannah feels the most appropriate. But I do think it's really good to uh, put this in the context of, of uh, when you are starting to deal with uh, issues of their, I always caution everyone who's a non-licensed practitioner uh, to step away from quote unquote feelings because um, my concern for all of you is, is that you don't want to step into areas of um, uh, areas that can take you down the, the path that could uh, you know, provide a, a problem for you professionally. You don't want to get yourself involved in a lawsuit where a parent comes back. I'm assuming that most of you are teaching the middle school age children or high school. And you don't want a parent to come back and threaten a lawsuit saying, what are you doing with my child? You know, I don't want you doing psychotherapy on them. I didn't give you my permission. So these are all things that you need to do when you're dealing with this. But this is a very benign little instrument that they can self-evaluate. And thoughts are, it's educational, it's informational. So you can kind of uh, give this to them in any format you want to. Uh, if it's online, you could certainly put this up and you can have them fill out what the situation was. Uh, like I've given you an example here in this tool. It says, I feel my heart race or I start to feel hot when I start to talk about wildfires. My stomach feels tight, I even feel a little dizzy. I also can feel myself sweat and I just feel really, uh, really nervous. I feel that I can do nothing about how I'm feeling. So if you go back to the top seven or six, you see that's the situation. So what's the situation? Well, it sounds like maybe there's a discussion about wildfires, right? So then the automatic thought comes into play for that student or participant. Their automatic thought is, I feel that I can't stop it. I'm out of control. There's nothing I can do about the next time a wildfire hits us. Okay, so that's the automatic thought. Um, to transfer that then, then they're gonna look around for evidence that's gonna support their thought. Um, and that would be, <clears throat> um, I feel like I will not know what to do, that I'm not gonna be able to be any help to my family, I feel really afraid. So that's what they're looking for to kind of put into their schema, their belief is, is that I'm young, what can I do? Um, you know, I, I can't help myself. So the next transfer is the alternative thought, and that's that replacement thought. We can never really replace their feelings about anxiety or nervousness, but what we can do is we can work on thoughts, and those thoughts ultimately will change and alter their behavior. So we, get, we wanna get them to kind of transfer that, well, wait a minute, you know, um, um, you know, even though I'm young, my family has to take, make sure I'm okay and take care of me. I can't take care of myself. That's that evidence to support that, what we call that maladaptive thought. We want to shift them into that evidence that does not support that thought. So and then the, there's another example. I'm smart. This is the student again. I'm a big help to my family. I'm learning all that I can about wildfires. I'm going to share with my family what I'm learning so that we are better prepared in the event of another wildfire. I can contribute to my family to help us all keep safe and understand what we all can do to help ourselves. I've learned about wildfires and what we can do when they come. So the number six is the alternative thought level graded now from what you were feeling when you first came into learning about wildfires. Just kind of like the tools that you just did before, right? How confident are you feeling teaching about wildfires? How confident are you feeling teaching them? So at the very beginning, you were less confident and now that you're maybe a little bit into it, a little bit more confident. So what we want to see this participant doing is, as you can see, if you go back to number one, the situation, the reading was an eight, right? Which is pretty high. We know one to 10, 10 being the worst and one being the best, no big deal. They're, they're feeling fine. They're, they can move on with life. 10, they're not doing great at all. This student is rated an eight. But now you look at the bottom and after, after, the, after number five, you can see that thought is now transferred to, wait a minute, I am okay, you know, I am smart, and I have learned a lot of things in this curriculum, and now I know what to do. I have a go bag, my, my folks have a go bag, and we know where to go. We've got telephone numbers, and we've got backup in our car, and we know where to go. That's the kind of thing we wanna see. By doing that, 
and then and then of course now the rating now is a one okay maybe it's a two or a one so what and this is just something this is a suggestion you don't have to use this it's just an obvious suggestion you can tweak it the way you want it but i think what this does is it keeps all of you away from talking about how are you feeling today how's it going what are your levels of anxiety today you don't want to really go down that road because you don't know who you are dealing with. And many of you have already got your own stories about your own personal experiences with fire. I do too, my husband and I, we just live right down the street from the university here, my husband and I. And so we're in, we're in, pretty, you know, we're in pretty remote area here ourselves. So um, I've got my stories to share, just like you all have your stories to share. And I think what we can do is by um, uh, giving ourselves those, those those levels of confidence that we can replace immediately. Like, oh, what am I gonna do? Where do I go? You have a plan for it, you make a plan for it, you make a map, your emergency exits, your go-to bags. Those are the kinds of things that we wanna empower uh, the participants. We really wanna stay away from, from investigating levels of anxiety because that child or that student may be coming to the table, we refer to it in mental health, uh, as uh, as uh, the GAF, or the Global Assessment of Functioning, and um, and what that what that is is that that is uh, determining on where they live. How are they living? Are they living under a bridge? Are they homeless? Are they living in a tent? Are mom and dad fighting? Are they involved in domestic violence? Uh, are mom and dad engaging in in a substance use abuse? Uh, you just don't know what's going on. And I can tell you for all the years that I've been doing this, uh, no matter what the event is, that when you're involved in talking to someone about an event, like in this case wildfires, it will inevitably bring up and surface other internal issues that are going on that are completely unrelated to wildfires. It completely unrelated. But it gives them a, a area where they can talk about what other issues that are going on. You don't wanna go down that road. You want to stay in an educational, informational model, and that's your role. If you get involved with a student who wants to talk about it, and they are traumatized, and you can see some of these symptoms are preventing them from participating, then that's the time where you need to refer out. And I always say to Hannah, refer, refer, refer. Refer to the professionals that are either in your school districts or whatever method that you all use. Uh, in corporate world, we use EAP. Within the school, we use the school counselor, but it's kind of tough. I mean, I did school counseling years and years and years ago, and I had 1,200 students to me, one person. So it's kind of, you know, it's difficult, right, for the counselor to get around to all the kids that need the help. But you do the best you can. I really caution you, we are all in this business to help people and help one another. We want to make people feel better, especially children. But that's not our role is to make them or, or reduce their levels of, of anxiety. What we can do is we can give them exercises and fun exercises to do. And, and it's been proven that physical exercise is one of the best things they can do. Artwork, drawing, singing, laughing, uh, sports, you know, uh, uh, running, track. You can do simple, you know, the shoulder rolls, these kinds of things where you roll your shoulders up and you lift them down, you know, the, the head back and forth. There, and there's all kinds of other game uh, samples I can give you that you can give to your students when they come in the classroom and you can see that they're having a, a problem. Now, oftentimes what happens is we have one participant that will start to use your forum as an opportunity to uh, basically use it to, to, their, to whatever they need. And you can't let them run away with that. You can redirect them quickly by saying, I can see that's, a, that's an issue for you. And I, I would be very interested to talk to you a little bit and give you some information about where I think you can go with that, or you know, where another resource that you can go for that. So you know, you know that you're gonna be referring them out to the school counselor or another therapist that's on, on staff or whatever, whatever the situation is. So, it is very, we all want to just run in there and fix it and make them, make them feel better. But my cautionary for all of you is, unless you're a licensed mental health practitioner, stay away from it because you're going to, you're going to, uh, you will threaten your professional position. You need to be very, very careful because parents are very alert to that. 
And you don't want a child coming home and saying, no, oh, you know, mom, dad, my teacher said I should do this, I should do that. And they're get, you're gonna get a call and say, what, what were you doing talking to my child like that? Or what were you doing uh, talking to them about their, their anxiety and, you know, what business do you have? So you have to be really careful. So just to clarify as well that Mackenzie is guiding us through, um, we've had a certain amount of trauma-informed elements that we've, gui that we've used to um, guide the curriculum so far. And Mackenzie is giving us kind of the final review to make sure that what we're putting out in the curriculum um, fits in with just what she's expressing right now. Um, but I guess I, I do want to just clarify Mackenzie, like overall, there's still value in us sharing these lessons, right? There is there is a value in hopefully guiding a student through that model you just showed us to them feeling prepared and confident. And there, there is this. Yeah, as long as it's, absolutely, absolutely. As, as long as it's informational and educational and instructional, um, you want to get away from the psychotherapeutical dynamics of talking about levels of anxiety. Because what do you do if someone says, or a child says, um, you know what, I feel so depressed, I don't feel like living, and I've got a gun at home, and I'm going to go get a gun, and I'm just going to go shoot myself. What, what do you do, see? What, what would you do? You don't want to get involved, and you don't want to do that. Now, obviously, you'd be calling 911. That would, what would you, you would be doing that immediately. You wouldn't be saying, oh, I'm going to refer you out to a therapist, or I'm going to refer you out to school. No, 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 no. That's an immediate 911. You call the police, the police will show up and they will do an emergency psychiatric evaluation and they're called a 5150. They will take that child or that whoever that you're working with and they'll place them in, a, in an involuntary hold at the, at the hospital, whatever the local hospital is. They'll hold them there for 72 hours. They'll do a suicide watch, homicidal watch. They'll do a notification of the person that they say that, you know, maybe that child say, I'm going to go shoot my parents because they're arguing. I just can't take it anymore. And, I can't take this. I can't take the stress of another wildfire. You don't know what is going to happen. So you have to be prepared. So that's why you don't want to get involved in digging around too much. Um, the experience of the wildfire, I would keep it very, again, uh, what did you find yourself? You could say, what did you find yourself? What activity did you do? You know, what, what, what did you do once you saw uh, the fire coming in your area? Uh, what did you and your family do? Or what did you do? Did you, did you go to a shelter? You want to stay away from feelings. You don't want to get involved in that. You want to stay away from, from the, from the behavior. What, what were the behaviors? Just focus on the behaviors, focus on the thoughts, stay away from feelings. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, Mackenzie, I just have a question and you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm just curious if you have any more insights. This is just from um, someone in the chat. Um, it says, should we prevent students from telling stories about their experiences or just keep redirecting toward the preparedness rather than rumination? That's exactly right. Whoever that person who put in that, yeah, absolutely. You don't want them ruminating about the story because that story could then trigger a vicarious uh, re-traumatization to everybody else in that group. You know, I'm sure you've worked with real, real little ones and, and a little five-year-old will start crying and then all the other five-year-olds start crying around them. That's what you're gonna get yourself involved with as you go down that road. And I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and you don't want to get yourselves involved with that because then you're in a situation where now you're in an emergency situation and you've got a bunch of people involved in social hysteria. Now what do you do? You know, you can't, you can't really dial 911 for a social hysterical situation. So the person who chatted, yes, definitely redirect. So again, keep it to when they're sharing the experience Keep it to be directional, be, be, be assertive in your direction, take hold of it. Don't let it for a free for all. This is a group therapy. You know, this is not group therapy at all. This is like, I'm Cher, hi, my name's McKinsey and I'm here to share about my, my horrific experience. This isn't, this isn't the form, forum or format. Um, but what you wanna hear is, so now that you've learned about fire prevention, what things could you pull out of that fire prevention or what have you learned now? Can you remember what you did uh, when this happened to you? Tell us what are the things that you pulled out of the curriculum that you did and what are the things that you didn't do? 
So you keep it really very structured, very tight. Don't let it free for all out. And if it starts to go that way, pull them back in, redirect them. And, okay, thank you. And, and but on, on, on this other list that we have of the things that you learn, what else did you do? What did your family do? Or what did your uncle do? Or what did your mom do? Now, if you have a situation where you have a child say, we lost everything, our house burned up and, uh, and uh, my grandfather died. Okay, what would you say? Anyone, anyone wanna give a shot? I'm so very, very sorry for your loss and, and how tragic for you. I'm so happy to hear that you're here involved in this program and learning everything that you can about fire preparedness. And it sounds like if you need some additional help with you and your family, why don't you come up to me after class or why don't you let me know and we'll see what other resources are available for you. That's how you quick nip it in the bed. It's horrible, that's awful, how tragic, but that's the shock and the aha, right? That, that captures your whole group. And now your whole group's gonna be thinking about grandpa who just died and burned up in this fire and this kid lost everything. It, it's gonna throw it all off. So again, this isn't the format to do that. This is a group therapy. This is information. And again, you know, house, you definitely want to show empathy. Of course, you know, we're human. How horrible that must have been. So horrible for you. I'm so very, very sorry for your loss. You do it with genuine empathy, genuineness, and, 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 and uh, absolute respectful regard for that child or that student or that adult who's sharing that information with you. And then, then you redirect I'm sure I've got some other resources and you want to make sure you have those resources and you know where you can redirect them and say, I'd be happy to share those resources with you, you know, and then again, and I'm so glad that you're here learning about this program and what you can do in the future for yourself. You know, you kind of like, it's like, my God, where do you go with that? This is really traumatic. There's nothing you can do to fix it, but you can redirect it. Does that Great. make sense to everybody? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. We just have a few more minutes here with Mackenzie allotted. Um, as you know, I know that a few of you have had questions about um, or just like um, things come up throughout the training for some of you. Do any of you have questions for Mackenzie um, before we end this little chunk of time? It's okay. Give it. Give me a shot. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Do you all know that if there is an emergency situation, that you would call 911, right? If somebody, if somebody. okay. So does does anybody have any questions about um, what does it look like uh, when a child starts to come apart? Have you ever been exposed to a child who starts to come apart at the seams, so to speak? Have it, a, any you ever seen that? Would anyone like to share what that looks like, you know, in that child? Some of the symptoms? I've had students um, who, I mean, I've dealt with both like sixth and eighth graders, some seventh, and um, for a handful of students, it looks just as you described with like a lot of anxiety, quick breathing, they kind of look zoned out. And I mean, knowing your students, I think is super important. Um, and what their sort of like normal behavior looks like. This is a, probably not a unit I would want to do, or especially this section that I would want to do um, at the beginning of the year when I have no idea who they are. Um, just so then that way I can gauge, you know, does Billy look okay or whatever. Um, so often the older students will say, Mrs. Lucia, I just, I need a minute. You know, I'm going to leave yeah. the room. That's okay. Like no big deal. Just stay outside. I'll come and check in with you in a few minutes. Do you want a friend to come with you sort of situation? Exactly. Yeah, that's really good. Some of the, the, the solutions that you could give, again, some of these learning instructional things that you could give to help reduce levels of anxiety with children, you know, certainly have them do the exercise, the sprints, there's uh, things that they call, uh, I'm a tree. Have you ever heard of that little exercise? I'm a tree. It's a grounding where everybody pretends they're a tree and then they just, they, they, they kind of, you know, put their legs apart like they're big trunks and they put their arms, they reach their arms up in the sky and they put their face towards the sun. And that's just kind of a grounding exercise. They pretend their legs are the roots that go into the ground 
and their arms are like the branches of the tree and they look up to the sun, that's just kind of a grounding exercise for them. Um, there's things where if they're really anxious or let, let's say it's online, they can write down whatever word they want. It could be wildfire, it could be fire, it could be, you know, mom, dad, what, you know, whatever the deal is. And then if they've got a shredder in the house or if they don't have a shredder, they can just rip it up before the class starts and throw it in the trash can. And that's just a throw away. That's just one thing. Um, since you guys are probably going to be doing online, right? You're going to be doing remote stuff. You're not going to be doing right in class. So there's another little game. It's called Nerf. It's called just a silent Nerf ball. And you have, you know, those little Nerf balls. And if you have a group of people or kids, they can throw it to one another. They can never repeat it. They have to throw it to somebody different each time the Nerf ball goes around in a circle. And that's always kind of fun. It shakes off the tension, essentially. And there's other kind of tension reducing exercises, the deep diaphragmatic breathing, of course, you know, breathing deep through your nose and then out through your mouth, like you're blowing candles out on a cake. You do it very slowly, like through, you know, one through four, where you breathe in deeply and you exhale through your nose. You do that maybe four or five times. And then you talk about, oh, that feels good. Or, oh, I feel a little lightheaded. If somebody does it too much, too deep. And you can just say, it's relaxing, isn't it? You know, or or have them, have them draw a color or use a color. What color do you feel like today? Oh, I feel like black today, or I feel like brown today, or I feel like yellow, or I feel like pink. That's always a good thing too, to just kind of break it out. They can, they can draw a flower. What kind of flower do you feel like today? Um, uh, music is always a great format for shaking off tension, uh, you know, just a lot of a lot of uh, physical a lot of physical stuff to get the get the tension out um again going back to that when someone has a really horrific thought uh, that they're thinking about you know the fire they lost their house they see their house burning up uh they lost loved ones in the fire that's the way that we want to redirect them very quickly into another thought that's more joyful for them Okay, you've, you've given that thought. Now, obviously, you guys aren't going to get involved in this, but if somebody, if somebody surfaces and pushes that out there, you, again, you show that empathy, you've got other resources, but if you're doing kind of a group instructional thing, you can say, okay, they don't have to share what thought that they're thinking of, fires, death, mayhem, whatever. Um, you can say, okay, now you've thought of that thought, and uh, just on a scale from one to 10, let's, let's make it a three, a two or a three, a thought that produces a little bit of anxiety or different, a little bit of distress for you. And then now I want you to try thinking of the most fun thing you've ever done, whether you go to Disneyland or you're playing baseball or, or whether you're going fishing or hiking or backpacking. So, and how does that thought feel for you? And most people go, oh, that feels pretty good. Yeah, I like that. I, I like, I like fishing. So, so you kind of show them about when they're going down the rabbit hole of the dark black hole of, of bad fire, whatever, they can switchly, uh, uh, quickly switch their, their um, thought by thinking of fishing or backpacking or hiking or working with sheep or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the deal is. I'm, I'm a 4-H too myself, so, um, but I had goats, <laughs> Nubians, little Nubians. But anyway, so that kind of gives you some idea. And there's lots of great little anxiety reducing games that you can do and fun exercises. And it doesn't have to go down the psychotherapeutical path. That, that's my big cautionary for all of you. Because I've seen too many teachers over the course of my life that got involved, tried to get involved and tried to do an intervention and they had all the best intentions. And it, 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 it became very bad for them professionally. You know, so that, that's just my cautionary for all of you. Unless you're licensed and you can do that, you know, within your environment, that's all there and deal. Mackenzie, I know we're drawing to a close on this section and I suspect we could easily fill up um, two hours just with asking you questions and I very much appreciate your time and your help. Um, oh, sure. One thing I've heard from other teachers is, and you've already alluded to it, but, um, I, and I, I'd, I'd love to hear the teachers who are online today, Sometimes I'm hearing from schools that just don't have the resources, right? They just, the counselor in some cases isn't even, there isn't somebody. Um, is there something else that you might be able to suggest in a case where a school's like, I don't have somebody from my school? Right. Um, well, hopefully, if any of your parents are employed, 
Most employers today are involved in what they call EAP, Employee Assistance Program. And in fact, I think with the teachers, they have their own EAP model. So you have your on-site school counselor, right? But then you have this, this division of Employee Assistance Program where you have EAP professionals and specialists all over the country, in fact, all over the world, that uh, can reach out to family members. And it doesn't have to be just for that employee. It is connected to any member of their family that are having issues, that are having problems. And so that, and if it's a child, um, that parent doesn't have to be with that child um, initially, but you know, most of this is online right now because of COVID and that has its own issues, right? That increases everybody's anxiety, yours, mine, everybody's. Um, but that is one way to go about it. The EAP is direct. They typically give you like maybe eight to 12 sessions, like once a week, half hour. And then there's usually kind of a follow-up of a couple of months after that, where they do kind of a check-in once, or rather six months. So it's actually pretty liberal. So you might want to have them look about what other resources were than the family. Um, also, sometimes the Y, the YMCA, YWCA, they have certain um, you know areas where they can have a lot of interns will do their internship there in mental health. Um, like I like I have a PhD and I'm also an LMFT, and um, in my uh, my uh, graduate school, when I was doing my internship, I actually worked for the YMCA. So I did a preschool after school care program. And, and a lot of times the kids would come up with all kinds of problems. And, you know, um, so that's another vehicle. Um, obviously, people culturally and uh, spiritually, religiously, uh, you know, if they belong to a church, a lot of times there's youth groups involved in church. I'm a Mennonite. And so I, you know, I have access to all kinds of online uh, stuff that, you know, can be supported the uh, kids. And, and so I'm sure through churches or through other memberships, uh, there's a lot of volunteerism out there that helps. Um, you might have, uh, they may say their parent is having a problem. Okay. Well, then there's the council on aging or grandparent council on aging. They have other, uh, you know, social workers that can meet with uh, families. So there, there's a lot of natural or rather community resources that are available to you, but each community is different. So you have to kind of look into that to see what is available, but those are just some ideas for you. I hope that helps a little bit. I know schools, there's not a lot. I know resources are slim. So you can ask for volunteers. Uh, I know some of you um, uh, have been docents and you've been doing volunteering work, retired teachers. There may be other people uh, that are retired uh, mental health practitioners that can get involved. It's a little touchy there because you know they have to have malpractice insurance, and it gets a little little dicey with that because you have to get parental permission. You know, there's all kinds of things you have to go through a little bit, so that gets a little little, little more challenging. They have to keep records, notes, you know, in case God forbid a child commit suicide or threaten suicide. You know, there's all kinds of backing and stuff that they have to do for that. So it gets a little more difficult with that. But I think with these other resources that are in play, that are in place and uh, uh, other people like myself or practitioners, you know, that the, the, they usually will, we're, we're called upon in all of our organizations to at least try to give 10% of our professional time in volunteerism. And I strongly believe in volunteerism. That's how I met Canada. The first stop was, through volunteerism, yeah, saying, "Hey, I saw your saw this in the this uh, in the paper. And good for you guys. It sounds like you guys are going to have a great curriculum. You're going to do fantastic, and and it's very needed. It's really, really needed. The community needs it. We all need it. So I hope I hope some of this helps. And I hope you can use some of this stuff." Mackenzie, that was absolutely fabulous. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we've done a couple of sessions already this week, and this has been rising to the top in all the sessions, that it's something we all have concern when we're teaching about wildfire. Um, so this is super helpful. Um, I don't want to cut you short at all, but I think we need to move on at this point. I think it's worth saying if folks do come up with a question, um, they could always share that with us, and I could relay it to you by email if, that, if you're willing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to. Thank you so much then. Mackenzie. All right, you guys. Bye. All right. Enjoy your day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. Um, and so um, we're going to move on to start thinking about our lesson series, our wildlife, wildfire preparedness lesson series now. Um, and I think it works quite nicely that lesson one 
is actually telling uh, is actually a story. I think maybe after that we're all ready for some quiet story time. <laughs> so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so um, the book that we refer to in this first lesson is called Once Upon a Wildfire. We are actually going to um, read that story in just a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to just start with a couple of um, elements of this lesson. So the objectives are that students can list some ways to be prepared for wildfire and why they are important, describe their feelings about wildfire. Now, it is important to recognize that, as I say, we are still developing this curriculum and Mackenzie is advising us. So we are making sure that what we provide to you ultimately will not put you in any difficult situations. But we do want to- So we'll probably maybe take out some of the feeling stuff there. Um, and synthesize questions they still have about wildfire preparedness to answer in future lessons. So um, we talked a little bit yesterday about some of the things that we typically do before we go into the classroom or when we first get into the classroom. Um, if you can connect with school counselors, great. Um, or have some other figure out maybe what mechanisms might work if you did need to find those support systems. Um, and to start working with those students on um, the ground rules. So um, what will make um, some rules for our community, our classroom community, to have this discussion and for us all to feel safe. So this is some ground rules that I came up with actually at Permalita um, with um, the sixth grade I was working with. And uh, so they said focus on the positive that often comes up and that's exactly what we want to be doing. Um, I, this s'mores was um, for us to remember all the good times we've had. Um, so to keep the positive elements in there, it's kind of following on from focus on the positive we talked about things that we think of when we think of fire and s'mores came up very quickly um, and that's our kind of good feeling about it. Um, that we want to feel comfortable, physically comfortable, be respectful, not be joking um, and that they know that they should let us know if they start feeling that anxiety. Different students come up with a different list. You can have some up your sleeve to start with that helps the process going, but that's really useful to use as your guidelines as you continue through the lessons. So this series of lessons is also a great time to be engaging with the parents because um, when we're talking about being prepared, it has to be the family or the home that the students living in um, have to be kind of involved to some extent as well. So there are going to be some materials that we'd encourage to be sent home to the parents as you go through the lesson series. There is also a really great opportunity here to perhaps host a um, school community meeting, a, um, a meeting for the parents of your class, uh, and that could well be done in collaboration perhaps with your local fire safe council. Um, there's lots of different ways that you could collaborate with partners to make sure that you had an opportunity for the um, parents and the community around your school to get as much information as possible. Okay, so I'm going to move across now and we're actually going to read whoops, our, our book Once Upon a Wildfire. Um, this book is actually written, Ali put me right here if I'm wrong, but I believe this is the um, Fire Safe Council Director for Butte County, is that right? Yeah. Excellent. So um, somebody who has a lot of uh, experience with fire and I think did a wonderful job with this book. I think one thing you might be thinking as we go through is that this is middle school and is this book a middle school reading level? Perhaps not, but um, it's certainly a very comfortable place to be um, learning a little bit about how we can be prepared. So I'm just going to go through, through reading it. As I go through reading it, if you guys could be thinking about ways that the family were um, preparing um, and uh, that would be great. We'll, we'll think about those after we've done the reading. Okay. So it's a story written after a series of devastating wildfires in Northern California to help kids and their families better prepare for wildfire and deal with its aftermath. And some of the illustrations, one of the things we learned through the process thinking about trauma informed education was that we don't want to be showing um, uh, photographs um, as much as possible. So this, the images in this book tend to really um, represent without being too um, traumatizing. It was a hot summer day. 
Julianne and her dad were riding bikes down their long driveway. They had been swimming at the creek to cool off and were now going home for some lemonade. Their family lived in the forest on the edge of a canyon. Julianne loved playing in the forest, climbing trees and building forts. Julianne and her dad stopped in the shade to take a break and to watch the osprey babies at the top of a dead tree. Higher up, they could see dark, puffy clouds. Those are called thunderheads, said Julianne's dad. I think they should be called roasted marshmallow clouds instead, replied Julianne. They both laughed. Soon they heard the rumble and boom of thunder. All of a sudden, lightning hit the ground nearby. Julianne felt frightened. As they rode closer to their house, they could see a puff of smoke rising out above the trees. I think the lightning hit a tree and caused a fire, said her dad. At home, Julianne's mom looked worried. She took them to the back of the house and pointed to a wildfire. Soon the sound of a fire engine echoed through the trees. The wildfire is growing quickly. We need to evacuate, said mom. There are some important things we need to do, added dad. Julianne grabbed their cat, Tom Petty and put him in a cat carrier. Her mom closed all the doors and windows. Dad grabbed their important papers and an emergency bag of clothes and food. Tom Petty looked confused in the back seat of the car. Julianne sat close to his carrier to comfort him. A fire truck pulled up in front of the house. It's a good thing you're ready to evacuate, said the firefighters. We are going to be able to fight the fire from here because you've created good defensible space. The firefighters began pulling hose off their engine. Smoke filled the sky. A giant airplane circled and dropped red fire retardant. The hot and tired family arrived at grandma's house two hours later. Their car had moved as slow as a snail due to the traffic jam. I am glad you left as early as you did, grandma says. Julianne took Tom Petty out of the carrier and he relaxed in her arms. Wow, that poor cat looks like a hot dog, said grandma. Do you think the fire was close enough to burn your house down? asked Grandma. Yes, but we've done a lot to be prepared, Dad said. We cleared brush and stacked it for the chipper program. We also cleaned out the gutters at the beginning of the summer, added Mum. Tom Petty hid under Grandma's couch all afternoon. When he finally came out, the family was watching the nightly news. Julianne held him closely. The news showed pictures of tall flames. The reporter said that the wind was pushing the fire and some houses may have been burned. Is our house safe? Julianne asked. Dad replied, well, houses catch on fire from embers most of the time, not from the flames. Remember when we write the pine needles away from the house? Mom asked. When embers land, they won't catch our house on fire. The family stayed at grandma's house for three days until the fire was contained. After three days, it was finally time to go home. It had been so smoky that Julianne had not been able to play outside. Julianne's family was worried about their house because the newspaper reported that 50 homes were damaged in the wildfire. A 
As they drove back on their long driveway, Julianne saw their house was still there. However, the fire had burned the forest and Osprey's nest. She worried that the mom and babies had not survived the fire. She wondered where they would build a new nest. They parked in the driveway and walked around the house to check for little fires. Julianne brought Tom Petty back into the house. He was happy to be home and flopped like a couch potato onto the sofa. That night, there was no electricity because so many power poles, power poles had burned in the fire. A week later, Julianne and her dad took another bike ride. They found a little patch of shade and parked their bikes. They walked into the forest and discovered that her forts had burned to ashes, but her favorite climbing tree was still green to its tippy top. Dad gave her a boost and Julianne climbed into its branches. As they continued their walk, they talked about the good and bad things the fire had done. There were dead trees standing that would need to be cut so they wouldn't fall on homes and roads. Birds and animals would have a hard time finding food. However, there would be more water for the big trees since the smaller trees had burned, the ashes of the fire would help the grasses grow thicker. Julianne's class went out to plant trees in the burned areas when school started at the end of summer. Some of the students had lost their homes and others like Julianne had lost their beautiful forest. Everyone was glad they had been evacuated and that no one had been injured. Julianne and her dad planted some of the seedlings from her class along their driveway. Julianne hoped that someday the osprey would return to build another nest. Until then, she had her favorite tree to climb and there were forts to be built. Okay. So, could you guys maybe, I know we don't have too much time, but there are the, here are the questions that we um, ask students to be noting down as we go through um, this story with them. So things Julianne and her family did to be prepared and why it was important or helpful. Um, just a couple of those, if anybody would like to just share with me something they might have noticed. Clean the gutters. Excellent. And the debris around the house. The chipper program. Excellent. Anything that you um, felt why it was important or helpful? Because Oh, I'm sorry, Henry. It sounds like your internet connection is still struggling. Remember. Not getting quite enough of your response. Apologies. <laughs> but for now, I mean, I think one of the things uh, that you, you can see. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, I was going to say the, the cleaning the gutters and the chipper program and the debris help to prevent embers from landing, which I think is what Henry was. I think mm -hmm. I heard him say embers. So. Mm hmm. It would uh, help to prevent fires from starting next to the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that's worth just recognizing is obviously if you have enough time to be going through multiple cycles, it's really nice to be able to link this back to the fire physics as well, because ultimately you're talking about fuel. Um, so yeah, there's many things that come up in that book. Um, often I found students are interested in how the cat's doing, <laughs> which I think is, is a very um, a safe way of thinking through um, how they're all doing too. Uh, so um, that often comes up in how the cat was prepared and how they looked after the cat too. Um, and so there's a full list which um, is expressed in the lesson plan for this activity. Um, but it's, it's a great way just to kind of open this up and then the students afterwards are encouraged. Let me just clear this, to just 
share um, some of the thoughts, and again, this is where we may just change the language slightly, the thoughts they had during the reading or discussion about wildfire preparedness, felt positive about this. So this is through work I did with um, students um, locally. I felt positive. I feel that I know what to do. I think everyone should know what to do in case of a fire. Um, and then the student said that they felt sad, but confident and prepared. And I think also one thing that comes out of this lesson is students are allowed to put down some of the questions they still have about wildfires. That's something that you can build as a kind of running list of questions through this um, lesson cycle. And then you may have experts that come in at different times and they can help you answer them or you can have a time that you can spend answering some of those questions. There are a few things we really focus in all of this cycle on things that we can change and not just that we can but the students have agency to change. Um, we also always focus on using very positive language, never fear-based tactics. So saying things like having your go bag ready lets you know that you can leave quickly. And firefighters do a lot to help us and having a good defensible space helps them. We also try to avoid mentioning specific wildfires. I know we all have our own experiences and those just come up very easily now. But um, if you keep it in general terms, then that avoids um, bringing up a term that perhaps will have a lot of memories for an individual student. Okay. And just a note too about, um, so we include a real version of the book in the curriculum kits and also um, the author has generously allowed us to include the PDF version um, with the curriculum. So um, you could have you could read that to your class aloud or if you feel like your class really wouldn't be into having you have like a story time you can just have them read through it on their own or in small groups um yeah we recognize it's definitely a book that has a little bit of a younger uh main audience but it still has a ton of really great um information and it pre presents it in just like a really positive way um, so the next lesson that we're going to go into will be um, to kind of further expand on what they learned while reading the um, Once Upon a Wildfire, and then also be preparing them for doing their school assessment, or if they don't do the school assessment, the Firewise Homes lesson. Um, so basically this lesson is just a PowerPoint with a, a game in the middle. And so I'm just gonna kind of quickly go through the PowerPoint. Um, included with the PowerPoint are little um, paragraphs of exactly what to say to go along. So if you're not someone who's familiar with fire or defensible space, um, we've included like a whole, um, just a whole kind of discussion template. Um, so when thinking about a wildfire and preparing for a, a preparing a structure for a fire, um, there's more than just when the flames are around the structure that you have to worry about. Um, about a half an hour um, before the fire arrives in the area, there's embers that are coming towards a structure. Then there's the fire front, which is when flames are active actively around the building. And then there's the post fire front, which can last for several hours. And it also includes um, the dangers of embers or direct flame contact. So there's a few different things that can ignite a structure. And one of those is flame contact. Another source is radiant heat. So sometimes during a wildfire, the air gets so super hot that things even not directly touching a fire can um, ignite. And then the final source of structure ignition is embers. And so these are coming through the wind um, and can, um, they move a lot like water um, so they just, when they hit something, they slow down until something catches them. And then that's kind of where they can catch something on fire. So now is the time when you would stop and you would play um, a, so if you're locally to this area, 
Um, you can rent this Ember House, where it's a game where the kids throw um, little uh, sandbags that represent embers and see where they stick most of the house. Um, we've made another version of this game that's um, pin the ember on the house. So you play it similar to pin the tail on the donkey and just do um, blindfolded um, pinning embers. We're trying to figure out a virtual version of this game. We'll keep in touch. Um, so this is just to get an idea of the fact that embers can hit anywhere on a house. And there are certain areas where if it hits, um, then it could cause a fire. So thinking about how we can mitigate any, um, how we can help like protect those areas from embers. Um, so then you'll just go through some of the aspects of an ideal fire resistant structure. Um, decks would be constructed in um, ignition resistant materials. Um, there wouldn't be anything under the deck and there's no combustible materials on top of it, or they're at least five feet away from the house. Um, in the, the roofs are made of metal, concrete, or clay tiles, or um, the average shingles are often made to be fire resistant these days too. It's really important to check your roof for debris. Um, cleaning gutters often to remove any built up vegetation. Fences should be made of non flammable materials or start at least five feet away from a structure. Window windows are dual paned with tempered glass. Vents are covered by eighth inch metal mesh screening. Siding is an ignition resistant material. Um, hardscaping components around the home, such as concrete, gravel, or stone walkways. Um, also, just having dirt around the home is another example of hardscaping. Um, so when thinking about preparing uh, any kind of structure for wildfire, maintenance is key. So thinking about removing things from the gutters, cleaning, debris on a regular basis during fire season. Um, all of those things are really important for being fire prepared. And then um, there's, um, excuse me. So when thinking about creating um, a home, if you live in a wildfire prone area, it's good to have a space around your home that's called a defensible space. And this is an area that doesn't have a lot of um, things that can easily catch on fire. So um, the National Fire Protection Agency has come up with different zones and um, rules for how we should have things designed or set in those different zones. So those are the immediate zones, the intermediate zones, and the extended zones. And so the goal of this really is they'll be doing an assessment on their school. So um, definitely reminding them that they should try and remember some of these zones um, so that when they're doing their assessment, they'll know where they are and what some of the rules are. Um, so another thing we wanna think about um, around our home is ladder fuels. So when you have plants that are near your structure, um, you want to make sure that they have um, a minimum clearance of six feet from the ground and that there's not different shrubs right underneath them that could help the, the fire on the ground spread to a crown fire. Um, so this is just a little diagram to help us think about how we want um, plants and trees and shrubs spaced within our um, defensible space. And when thinking about an action plan, you want to start closest to a structure and then work your way out from there. Um, you might be curious about why it stops at about 100 feet. Um, and that's just because the research shows that once you get out past 100 feet, those things don't impact your homes or a structures. Um, likelihood to, uh, to survive a fire as much. 
So another thing you want to think about well, um, in wildfire preparedness is evacuation planning. Um, so having a go bag ready and also creating an evacuation plan with a map of some different ways to get out of your um, town or area and then having um, with you a list of people to call. And oftentimes during wildfires, um, cellular service can go down. And so having a, a written down list of phone numbers can be really helpful. And having a map with directions drawn out can also be really helpful. Um, so I just kind of did that just super quickly, didn't read through everything just for time, but just to give you an idea of what kind of information we're trying to share with the students um, before they go on to do their um, school assessments. H Hello, this you, is Henry. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I just want you to let you know Gay and I have lost our internet, so we're just listening in on the telephone. Just so you okay. know our participation level. Yeah, and I do yeah. have a comment. About, can I make a comment about this? Because I've been, you know, most of the kids we're dealing with are, what's the famous phrase, underserved. They're living in trailers. They're, if they're living in a house, they're, uh, they're surrounded by trees they can't do anything about. Their parents rent. They can't change their house. And, uh, and I can just see this creating incredible feelings of helplessness in these kids saying, here's all the things you can do, but you can't do that because you don't look like this white middle-class suburbs you keep seeing in these pictures. Yeah, so that, um, one of the pictures that we did show in the um, PowerPoint is actually a mobile home in a trailer park. Um, and we tried to include yeah. that really consci conscientiously. Um, it is a very well landscaped trailer park um, yeah, but but we're talking. We're not talking trailer parks. We're talking about a trailer in the middle of a lot. It's surrounded by trees that they're renting that they have no authority to change. <laughs> you know, it's like, and it's very poor. It's an old trailer, uh, and uh, or the houses are all surrounded by trees that they have no power to cut down because they don't own the land. And I mean, it's just very. You're, I mean, it's, in other words, it's very, very difficult for these people to do any of this. Yeah, and it's so, obvious that it's um, I just I'll. I'll, um, yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to do with this lesson, and I might have flipped up a couple of times, but in talking about fire resistant structures, we always talk about structures as opposed to homes. And then what we go on to do in the next lesson is to do a school assessment. So one of the things that we're focusing on is areas that the student can change. And so why we do the school assessment and some background information of the school assessment is the teachers kind of talking with the administration ahead of time to see if you, if, if it is possible to make changes. So we wanted to focus more on the school um, as a place where they can make changes and most schools likely want to be following firewise guidelines. So we're focusing more on the school um, as a place for students to build agency around um, as opposed to their homes because, and this is something that I relate to, I live in a rental, my rental, um, there's another house about 10 feet away from mine. Um, it had, it's really old. It has this wood kind of siding that will certainly catch embers. Um, our landlord has this pile of wood that he likes us to leave on the porch. Um, there's trees around my rental. Um, so um, this is something that I relate to a lot, but yeah, so that's why we're kind of trying to focus on saying structures instead of homes and then focusing on the school building as a place for building agency. And then there are small things that you can do no matter what. Um, cleaning out your gutters is something that you can um, ask your parents about doing or ask if you can help your parents to do. Um, raking around your house um, is something that every student can do no matter what their age. I've been, I was always in charge of raking as 
who have been doing it since first grade. So middle schoolers can certainly rate. Um, thinking about where you have your trash can at your house. Is it right next to your house or is it a little bit out? Mm -hmm. um, you know, having them glean some of those ideas is helpful, but that's why we're really focusing more on the school building as a place for creating change. I think- yeah, the, Thank you. Yeah, the other thing, I, I think it's a really important point that you're making, Henry, and of course, when you're working with a group of students, you're gonna evaluate what's the right thing to be doing with them, and maybe this is, this is something you've decided is not the right thing. Um, but I think one of the things, guided a lot by Kate, who we met yesterday, she sees this as an area where we can genuinely make a difference in the community's outcome in a wildfire situation. So um, we are focusing on the things that they can do and it may actually make a huge difference. So balancing those two elements is um, kind of really crucial. Like on one hand, we might feel we don't want to share any of this information because it's too traumatic. And on the other hand, if we don't share information like this, people's outcomes could be worse and we really want to make it as good as it can be. Can I, I have a quick, quick, oh sorry, go ahead Stephanie. Well, you, it's interesting that you say that because I feel like it's also a re-education in the sense that if we start teaching our youth, when they become adults, they're going to know this. You mentioned earlier that Smokey the Bear did a really effective job and I think, and I came out of that generation, in fact, the very first book that I was ever given is a Smokey the Bear book that I still have to this day. And um, I think that's what was, you know, basically preached to the previous generations. And so it's time to change that. And if we don't start at some place, we're not going to change it. I also wanted to bring up that I'm wondering if one of the like advocacy projects that we have the students do is trying to um, have students like work with their immediate neighbors, like whether they're in a trailer park or whether they're in some sort of setting where they have um, maybe multiple community members in a certain area to like not lobby but like lobby their their landlord mm -hmm. to say okay, this is in your best interest and also mine and kids are I mean when they have like a really big cause they can get really excited about it and really passionate about it and they kind of don't stop talking about it and it could be a great way to really <laughs> put the pressure on yeah. some folks. Um, I mean, I understand that there's a, there's a whole lot of implications about affordability and even on the landlord side of things, but um, at least the landlord would have some impetus or some um, note that it's not just a one person who wants to have this happen for their property, but many people or the whole community. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of it too. Um, in thinking about creating social change, uh, you know, so seatbelts used to not be a thing. Um, seatbelts were put in cars and they taught kids first about wearing seatbelts because they knew that kids would bother their parents to wear their seatbelts. Um, so to a certain extent, teaching youth is a really effective way to create community change. Um, so there's a little bit of that hopefulness in our, in this lesson plan too. So I, I know we need to keep moving fairly swiftly to try and get through these. So I'm going to move us on to the school assessment now. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the things we've just been talking about, um, will come up here as well. So, uh, let's get going. So for the objectives of this, um, lesson, uh, students can collect the data needed to see how well their school follows FARWISE recommendations, compile and compute data into a presentable format, and present their findings in front of their peers. So this is actually a picture, um, Meredith, I wonder if you recognize these people. Uh, this is at Pamelita School and- Yeah, uh, that's Kira Gibson. <laughs> Right, so that's Ms. Gibson who I was working with um, just before coronavirus all kicked in and we were working with uh, the students there. Um, so the first thing we did, where I went through the whole series of lessons with them during the week. Um, we checked in with the school administration and um, they were happy with us to come up with a plan with the students, um, an advice plan of what could be done at the school. When you are um, working with the administration on that, it's really important to clarify to them that we are not planning on building with the students a multi-million dollar 
shopping list for them. What we're planning on building is very achievable actions, many in which the students may be able to take action themselves. So we're looking at low cost, achievable projects. Um, because of course you can imagine school administration feeling like I don't want anything to do with this if it's going to be, you know, the students telling us that we're not safe unless we spend millions of dollars that we just don't have. So um, it's also important for you to think before you um, get into this too deeply is the students need to feel a sense of agency. And so you need to think through who are they going to be presenting to? Is it the school board? Is it a student association? Um, is it um, somebody within your school caretaker kind of system? Um, so make sure you have a sense of who those people are and that will help you to gauge as well kind of how you're going to um, encourage the students to make their presentations. You, this is a great opportunity to partner. You can see here, um, we were actually partnering with the local um, fire protection district. So they came out when we did the school assessment for the day and they provided and um, guided one of the areas. And it also just gave the students the chance to check in with those firefighters and ask them some of the questions that they wanted to. Some of those difficult questions that had come up in the last questions, in the last lesson, we could then answer. So um, it's a great time to engage your fire safe council, your cooperative extension offices. We had our forester come out, the forestry advisor for the area come out on the day too. Um, if you know of other volunteers with experience in this area, obviously I know all my volunteers have um, background checks. So you wanna be um, cognizant of things that you may need to take into account. Um, before you um, go out on the school premises with these partners, who might be guiding small school groups to help them make their assessment. Make sure you check in with those partners about the tone and the messaging. So make sure that they are also aware that we're not looking for a multi-million dollar list, that we're gonna focus on the low cost and make sure that they're aware of the positive tone that we are always giving. Um, it's just important to make sure they're on the same um, lines as you on that. And then in advance, you're gonna to want to gather together maps of the school, get a sense of how large the school is. Um, Pomalita is a you know, decent sized campus, so it was really going to take us um, multiple sessions to do a full evaluation, or maybe you're gonna just focus on one particular area. Um, you're gonna want cameras for each of the student groups, measuring tapes, or perhaps they're going to just pace it out, but then do some math back in the classroom to understand how the distances were. Um, you may need some tree tags if you think you're going to be marking trees that then would help for um, uh, any after work that needs to be done. And then you're going to need the printed checklists. And I've got an example of one of those in the next slide. This slide just shows you how you'll be breaking the student group up. So one student group is going to be working in the zero in the, at the building itself. Another group will be working in the zero to five foot zone. You'll have another group working at five to 30 feet and the last group working out 30 to 100 feet. And obviously that depends a bit on your school site and how it looks, but um, that's how you're going to be able to divide up your, your groups. Each of those areas has a really handy dandy checklist for you to use. So you don't just have to send the students out and say, okay, remember everything from that presentation and make your list of what needs doing. There is a very clear guide for them to go through with one sheet of questions for each of those areas. And that helps, you know, again, if you're working with partners, sometimes the partners want to talk about other things, but you can keep the guide as the um, essence of what the students are trying to look at. So um, I just wanted to give you an example of what we got from our work at Pomalita School. And unfortunately, this was just literally the week before um, schools closed um, due to the coronavirus and uh, so they didn't get to present their assessments but we had a really positive day looking at what could be done. So the things that they noticed and I think probably are fairly typical at many schools um, was uh, debris and there were certain areas where there was quite a lot of litter and they thought that that would be a great project that the students could do just for school beautification alongside um, decreasing fire risk too. They also noticed that some of the vents around the school, they had the tape measures out, they were checking that um, some of them did not comply with the eighth of an inch um, covers. And uh, that was something that they were going to feed back to um, encourage that those vents could be replaced. And again, that really shouldn't be a too costly project, could be fairly simple. 
And then the other thing that they did notice, which was probably the biggest issue at Pomalita, was many of the buildings were surrounded very closely. You can see this is just maybe a foot or so from the building with a lot of vegetation. Um, now that was an area that was a little bit more tricky because it would be a good, a big project for them to do. Um, and of course, one of the questions that came up from the students but was, but what about the beautiful trees? And so we talked through a little bit about the fact that you'll sometimes be making decisions about, okay, we don't want to chop this tree down, but we could just take a few limbs off and that would make it a little bit safer. So um, it, we don't, we're not talking about um, just eliminating all the beautiful natural green around the school and uh, the students feel kind of more confident once they have that conversation. So I have a really quick video here um, just to show you a few minutes of the students. I'm, I'm aware there's sometimes a lag playing video but I think you'll get the sense of it even then. Well you know what we should do things so what about what was one of the things you just told me? One thing. We noticed that plants were really close to the siding. Can you show us a place on the video where that's happening? Uh, show us somewhere. Where, right where are the plants really close to the building? Right there. They're like, they're hanging over the building. And where else? Anywhere else you're seeing them really um, close by to the so building? By the STEM building and by the library. I noticed that we then have no really... Oh, apologies. I noticed that the, the bench don't have really good areas to close it. Great. So they don't have very good areas. Can you describe why that's a problem? Um, because it can start a fire from outside and it could come through and start more embers that could come through and touch these plants. So I think that just gives you a sense of how into it oh, the school the students get. Um, okay, I know we need to keep moving through things, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn back over to Ali. Ali, you're just that's it. <laughs> So in the case that your school um, does not feel comfortable doing that kind of assessment, um, there's another alternate lesson that we've made, or um, you know, if you're doing virtual learning, there's an alternate lesson that we've made where students can go through and look at pictures of different homes and kind of rate. Um, how well they're doing, some things that they can improve on easily, some things that they can improve on that might take more time. Um, so to do this lesson, um, you would start off with a discussion. Um, you start the discussion by asking students to stand up if they agree with the state, oops. If they agree with the statement, um, many wildland ecosystems need fire and then you can have them sit down and then stand up if you agree with the statement wildland fire can hurt people and destroy homes um so you know if they agree with it they stand up and then sit down so if both of these things are true um then it creates a bit of a problem so what do you do with um, you know, these two things that are both true, um, like w the ecosystem needs fire, but that fire is dangerous. So what can we do to help um, kind of mitigate these two true things that interact negatively with each other? Um, so then after having this inter like um, introductory chat with them, you would talk a little bit more about the FireWise guidelines and how they can allow us to live more safely in places with uh, wildfire. And then you would just go through and look at these photos of different homes and try and make up, um, try and pick out some things that the homeowners could do to fix. What are some things the homeowners are doing well? What are some things they need to work on? So we'll just do that for a few different photos really quickly. Um, so you can take yourself off mute uh, and just say, uh, let's start with a good thing. What's one thing that this homeowner is doing really well? 
very few shrubs or um, like close to the house low plants. Yeah, great. It's got a uh, green grass growing around, so that's got moisture. It's not going to catch very easy. Yeah, awesome. Another thing that I noticed too is that he doesn't have anything under his um, his deck, which is great. There's nothing stored under there. What are some things that this person could do to improve uh, the fire safety of their their home? His roof. Yeah. The roof. I mean, find needles off the roof. Permanent yeah, the, yeah. So tree. cleaning the needles. Anything else that we see? He's got uh, dead branches on that uh, tree growing right off his porch that should be pruned off. Yeah, um, great. I shouldn't have lattice under that part of the deck because that's flammable. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of brush around the base of the trunks. Yeah. Yeah. Also just the kind of like, looks like maybe a pine tree or something growing right next to the driveway. Might want to prune that back a little bit just in case, um, just for easy evacuation. Um, yeah, so what about this one? What are some things that they are doing well? They are escaped. It's got a lot of rock and cement right around yeah. the outside. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, there's you no know, flat space. Yeah, and what are some areas for improvement on this house? Probably want to get rid of those shrubbery under those garage light. Mm hmm Yeah, and the planter boxes too, right? Mm -hmm. And these are all kind of interesting like, things. Oh, go ahead. I said it looks like mulch right up against the zero to five foot space thing, and that's combustible. So probably change it to non-combustible mulch or rock or something. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, and um, a lot of these things too, another part of this um, discussions with students is um, the the ideal of what we think of as beautiful or how a house should be landscaped around you know this idea that we should have shrubs right next to our house or um uh, little planters right on our porches um you know these are all like I, beauty ideals for homes across the country that maybe aren't as fitting for our area. So starting to rethink like how we do landscape is like a real um, mind changer. So planting these ideas early in students' heads are really great. Um, maybe we'll do one more. This, this house was recently um, done with a lot of help from our local um, master gardener. And so they put a lot of thought and energy into, um, you know, designing this, this yard. But I still think that there might be some areas for improvement. So I'm, I'm curious if you all want to start off with uh, what needs to be improved in this one. Looks like some of those shrubs are getting a little close to the house. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And it's hard to tell, but it looks like he's probably got enough space behind the house, but yeah. pretty thick back there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this is just a lesson um, that you can use alternately. Um, you don't feel comfortable doing this school assessment. You can just go through a few of the slides to get students to really be thinking critically about um, some of the preparations that homes can make. Um, yeah, and so then we'll just have Hannah present a little bit about go bags and communication plans. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Hannah. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, so this is the last lesson in the series. Um, and I, I think if you're picking and choosing some lessons, I know often if I really feel like we don't have very much time, this one I find is really critical. Um, because again, this is giving the students something that they can be really proactive in um, and make a difference. Um, I don't know if you guys have had the same experience as myself, but I know when I have had evacuation, um, I really wasn't that prepared. <laughs> and um, like the first time around kind of was like, oh, I'm glad that was kind of a practice run and now I feel more prepared. So um, the more we think ahead, the better. So during this, they can build their communication plan with their family and they can plan or create their go bag. So this is another time when you're going to be sending a little bit of information home to the parents. Um, we have tried to um, look into getting uh, materials bilingually. So that's something that we, we hope we'll be able to develop a bit further so that you've got that in Spanish as well. Right, Ali, I'm just trying to remember. I know that was something we've, we've looked into. So um, the parent information includes the emergency supply checklist. So uh, again, this is not necessarily something that the student should be tasked with. Um, we don't want to make them feel too much that it's all on them, but it's certainly something they could discuss with the parent. And maybe something they want to take charge of is the pet food or um, something similar. And the other element for the parents is the family communication plan. Um, and that then again can be discussed with the students. So when this information goes home, it's really good to give the students a few days um, to kind of have some of those conversations that might be had at home. And then for the students themselves, during this lesson, we're going to talk with them about what might go in a go bag. Um, don't be afraid to um, talk with them about some of the things that they might feel are kind of silly, but actually are super valuable. Um, so, you know, what do you have in your go bag that um, might be a much loved toy from home, you know, and uh, and that's maybe something they want to be thinking about. What's really precious that I want to make sure I have with me. It's going to make me feel um, really confident and comfortable. Um, and then when they've pair shared a little bit with other students in the class about the kinds of things that they might put in a go bag, then they can make their own go bag list. And that's something again that they may be able to go home and actually put together or at least give a little bit more consideration to. The other thing is that after the parents hopefully have worked on that communication list, um, they can also make sure that they have um, the students individually have a um, wildfire communication point. So an out of area central point of contact for all family members, a family or friend near home and a parent or guardian work phone. So um, that's a little card that all the students get and they can get that filled in in the next few days so that they know they have that somewhere safe and that they'll be able to refer back to that in any kind of situation. As I mentioned, um, other elements that the students could play, so that's links in there as well, um, to the wildlife preparedness for household pets. I know a lot of students really kind of like that sense of they want to look after their pets and that's something they feel very um, enabled to do. Um, and I know in Ms. Gibson's classroom, they were like, we are going to devise a to-go bag for our class pet. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways where they can practice that information. Um, there's also um, another link here, which is just another kind of um, emergency to-go kit, um, but it's perhaps a little more accessible. So all of those links are in the lesson plan. And then after you've gone through that lesson, so this is a picture I took of me and my daughter this morning with our um, special items. Hers is her latest stuffy, which changes on any given day, but you know, that's what today's is. And then, um, you know, I have a plate that my mum painted for me. So, you know, we, we were showing, we have our own special things that go in there. But make sure that the students do have a little bit of time to um, communicate with each other, perhaps after they've gone through this. Um, maybe a few things about what, what, what was challenging, um, what are some of the concerns that they still have. Um, and then it says in the um, lesson as well, wildfire preparations can make anyone, even adults feel nervous and allowing students to talk about their experience can give them a chance to voice these. If there are any students who are particularly affected by this activity, it might be a good idea to have the school counselor on hand to help students process their feelings about this Again, the goal of these activities are to help the student be and feel prepared, not to scare them. So providing a safe environment to complete this process is important. Okay, I'm gonna 
stop sharing at that point and to hand on over to Ali once more. So that's kind of all we have for you today. Um, we just wanted to leave a little bit of extra time end of today's lesson, just in case you had any questions. Um, just know, um, so be looking in your inbox next week. We'll be sending out um, an email that has the links of things that we've discussed. Um, remember that the curriculum as shared with you is just a draft. The official versions will be on that frames website that we shared yesterday. Um, so if you are wanting to um, share this with other people, using that version um, would be better. So some of the things that are in the versions that we sent you might change. Um, yeah, any resources that were mentioned, we'll be emailing to you. Yeah, and if you have any questions or comments on the curriculum, anything that you've read, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be working on putting the final touches on everything um, before we get it up on the website. So um, any feedback we would love to hear. Um, yeah, are there any other questions before we wrap up for today? I had a very specific question um, that was mentioned earlier about defensible space. And I, I think this was actually brought up at the, um, it was like a conference or like a group a couple of days about private um, land management and fire on private lands. And there was a, a point, and I don't recall who brought it up, about that there was some research um, saying that you don't want to clear too much inside certain areas because some of the like if there's smaller brush let's say at like 150 feet that it can catch some of the flaming material and prevent it basically from like entering mm -hmm. your home space i don't know like i wasn't sure if i misunderstood that or yeah yeah so that's some new research that's coming to light from studying um homes that made it through the campfire um that you know, it's having a few trees, it like well spaced trees that don't have ladder fuels, even within your defensible space zone, can be really helpful um, to block some of those embers from hitting your house. So if the trees are um, living healthy trees that don't have that, like that are green, um, and not dead and easily flammable, um, having some spaced out house um, trees around your house can can be helpful. And so that's something they're still trying to tease out exactly how many, what the spacing should be um, within the scientific literature. But yes, yeah, that's something that I've heard in going to a lot of presentations recently as well. Um, I think at least my experience, because I've been really involved in going to every fire preparedness meeting in my area, um, just to gain information for this curriculum, but also because I'm a, a member of this community. Um, a lot of people have been getting really overzealous and just cutting down everything within 100 feet of their house, um, completely clearing all trees, all shrubs, they maybe just have a little bit of grass. Um, and that's not entirely necessary. Um, and yeah, as they're finding from those studies, maybe not as helpful. Um, so yeah, definitely just making sure that the trees and shrubs that are in your um, immediate and extended zones are well based and don't have um, Wow, their fuels going up to them is um, my understanding. And Mark, you might even know more than me because it seems like you have a lot of training in this area. So feel free if you want to type something in the chat box. I know you your thing has been a little scratchy. Yeah, I'll put a link um, for UCANR. We have UCC Maricosa. There's really good uh, 
some wildfire preparation for your home and preparing your landscape as well. And they do talk about that, the latest research as well with, um, yeah, don't just get rid of everything because you need you, those trees um, and your perimeter could help with embers coming into your, to your landscape or to your roof. So I'll put that link in the chat box. Thanks, Mark. And then uh, actually a follow-up question that came to mind. Um, you were talking about being involved in your like fire council or in your area. Um, I have been talking about prescribed fire to my fire safe council and other things. And um, not from everyone, but from a handful of people in the area. And I'm wondering if this is something you've experienced in teaching this curriculum to or preparing the lessons that um, there are some folks who are very, very resistant to either prescribed fire or um, prescribed grazing, those kinds of things, um, and how you combat that. Yeah, um, that's a huge struggle. You know, when I'm talking to um, different folks, even with environmental organizations locally um, in our area, some of them just have this idea that they, the, the thick forest of the Northeastern style is still like an aesthetic that's in most people's mind. And so thick, um, heavy removal of plants is something that gets people really heated like they get really heated if you're like doing a clearing project and creating kind of like an open space that you know having more space between the trees they're like oh where's my nice thicket that i'm used to seeing <laughs> um so i think definitely talking a lot about that um talking about the tribal uses of fire and how manicured well tended the the tribes kept our landscapes um, prior to Euro American settlement and how that changed their interactions with fire um, is definitely something I use a lot. Um, many people don't know that these areas burned as frequently as annually to help um, clear brush pre um, previously. So I talk a lot about that. Um, prescribed fire is also one of those things that is very heated because people think about their experiences during a wildfire and they think that they, they combine the two. Um, so then talking about how, um, how many safety measures a prescribed fire has in place um, all of the different things that they're doing, the time of year that they're burning and how that makes it different from um, a typical wildfire can be really helpful with those things. I know locally a lot of the prescribed fires that I've had in my area is people are burning in winter. Um, so they're out there actively like working really hard to make things burn. Um, so it's not a fear of having an escaped fire at that time because they're like kind of like dousing. They're like throwing some kerosene on that, <laughs> um, on that landscape. You know, a lot of the prescribed fires around here, we have a normally a pretty dry February. So people know it's like dry, but not too dry because it's still February. Um, so that's when we have a lot of our prescribed fires. Um, so yeah, just talking about the safety measures that go into place around prescribed fire, but it is a huge change in mentality um, to create this idea that the landscapes that are fire safe are beautiful. Um, those open landscapes are desirable that's a huge change in mentality. And so that's just one of those things that education um, has to play a big role in. 
I think some of the information in our first cycle of lessons that um, natural and cultural ecology of fire is uh, can play into that conversation as well. I think changing our relationship with fire is so crucial now. And that was one of the things that came out really strongly in the um, advisory group that we had with um, some of the tribal members in advice on this is that it's a very special tool that we have gift we are gifted with. Um, so I, I think that changed my attitude a little bit. Uh, I did want to just take the chance before you guys all head out to lunch. Um, I wonder if you'd mind in the chat, just writing um, perhaps one or two ways that you think you'll be able to use this curriculum in the next year. I know we know, none of us know what we're gonna do, <laughs> but if you could perhaps put forward some idea of a way that you hope you might use it, that would be really helpful. And if anybody has any other questions, Ali and I would be happy to take them too. Hi, this is Henry. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I wasn't sure whether I was, whether I was muted or unmuted. Um, the, the, in Lake County here where I am, the, in the park we work with, have been trying to do prescribed fires as basically been trying to control some invasive teasel and some other stuff. That means you have to keep doing it. Uh, and, you know, it's just been very difficult. Uh, there's such a negative... Uh, uh, thought about it uh, and for, a lot of them have been shut down uh, because of smoke mm -hmm. just smoke in other words what happened is we'll st they'll start in the middle and then they'll get complaints from people the smoke is going in the houses they're, they're st smelling smoke and it's causing my, my grandmother who was in the forest fire to, to have a flashback and, and the county shuts them down every time Hmm. Just the thought of smoke. <laughs> so it's, it's, so there have been three or four shut down, just be, literally, because it's creating smoke. And then people are smelling the smoke and then getting calls to the fire department saying there's a fire. And, uh, you know, of course, oh, they wow. probably could have pu publicized it more. But it's been, but it's been, and, and the other comment I have is it just takes one mistake. We had a burn, uh, uh, break loose uh, uh, here a while ago. It was actually on the, one of the county supervisor's land, and he was just burning a pile, some grapes. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't doing a really good... But he, since he knows he was a county supervisor and knew everything, he didn't bother informing the fire department. There was no fire truck on hand. There was no... And it got loose, and it burned, you know, 70 or 80 acres of other people's land. And that's just the story everyone tells now. Uh, and once that happens once, that's just writ large and that's what everybody knows and it's not safe uh and it's really it's it's a real struggle uh in these areas where we've had these horrible fires i mean <laughs> to think about lighting a fire it just really is and so it's just can't be over you can't you can't overestimate the problems with uh, trying to go into these areas and doing that yeah yeah and definitely um even just like your cow fire um fire chief for your area can play a big role. I know that my local fire chief is not interested in prescribed burning. And so he, uh, the local prescribed burn association that's trying to start up is facing challenge after challenge with um, just not being able to get the permit to do it. So I think as the understanding that having prescribed fires, using fire surrogates can help make us safer in the long run. Um, you know, s slowly these things will start to change. Um, I can even see now as the more modern, um, the newer graduates coming more into jobs who have an understanding of prescribed fire and fire surrogates, I can see like the the pushing on the old guard and the changes of the systems happening. Um, yeah, so fingers crossed, uh, some real change happens soon because I think we'll all be safer for it. And I think it's worth noticing that there's some really successful community prescribed burn associations now. Um, I know Humboldt's been doing really well for a while now, and there's an advisor um, with UC up there who would be happy to share experience. Mendocino is currently working on their prescribed burn association, um, I believe Sonoma County as well. So I think we've got some great models out there of where it's been um, successful. And the more that people can see prescribed fires, then I think they'll... Um, 
the more knowledge they'll have about them. You know, I feel like living here in a site where I have one road in and one road out, and it does scare me during fire season. I've had experience of wildfire here and prescribed fire here. And the feelings I have in those two situations are completely different. Um, and people need to have that, that kind of memory. <laughs> And Hannah, I think uh, what Kate said was very important that prescribed fire is not the only tool in our toolbox and we don't have to feel helpless just because we can't prescribe burn. We just like fire safe landscaping around your home, we can prepare our whole communities just as well to where we feel relatively safe when wildfire does come our way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole lot of fire surrogates that we can use that are also tools in the toolbox. Um, and this might be getting really deep into uh, like funny research things, but I found it really interesting. I read a bunch of studies that compared the carbon impacts of fire versus fire surrogates for those who are concerned about using fire for its release of CO2 gas. So that'll be something else that I, the, I'll i try and figure out where I was reading about that and send it all off to you. Um, because the fire surrogates, some of them do have a climate impact as well. Yeah, last year we had a gentleman in our community. Uh, he just kind of started this business and he has an incinerator that he tows around on his truck and he's got his own fire truck. And so he came to our school and burned most of the brush that we had stacked up. And oh, cool. my ag class, we went out there and they got to throw the brush in and pretty much watch it vaporize. It was pretty cool. And we had a couple embers pop out and light some grass on the side. So we got to fire up the fire truck and let the students run the nozzle and their eyes lit up tremendously. Oh, wow, that's awesome. It was uh, it was pretty neat, but uh, I can't remember the guy's name right now, but um, if I can find it and locate it, I'll email it to you, uh, Ali and Hannah. Thank you. Maybe you guys can contact him and learn more about it. Yeah. I know the day that we did the Permalita um, fire assessment um, just happened to be a day that they were doing a prescribed burn on the hill just behind the school. And there was um, helicopters, fire, they have like a fire torch on the helicopter. I've only seen them this one time. And so the students at first were like, oh no, there's a real wildfire there. And then we realized this is a prescribed fire. Look, they're actually burning the hillside with these helicopters. And the students were like, wow. So um, there was a lot that they managed to learn from that experience too. So I, I see we're just a couple of minutes away from the end. Um, I think Ali and I both want to say a huge thank you to all of you guys for all of the engagement that you've shown. I know we've asked a lot of your time this week. I know teachers are really struggling right now because you're going back to remote learning. There's a heck of a lot that you're handling. So for you to have given time and effort and thought to this is really huge, including even homework assignments, right? It's a lot that we've asked of you. So thank you for, um, for your time. Thank you for all these resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Likewise to you two for your time. Yeah. Yeah. And stay in touch if you do want any support in using these lessons in any way. Um, we're happy to offer support as you figure that out. Happy school, new school year. Enjoy it. I hope it goes well. And um, we'll uh, look forward to being in touch in the future. <laughs>